Hey you guys, movie retrospective time once again. As you can see, uh, I'm on my own for this one. It turned out that the, the last day that we had to record this before, you know, it, so it could go up in time, uh, Tom remembered at the very last minute that he actually had an eye appointment uh, at his thing like at the VA like an hour and a half away. So he wasn't gonna have time to record this and me get it edited and stuff like that to get up in time. So I was just kind of like, you know what, I'll just do this one by myself because uh, honestly he was, doing something and he missed the first half an hour of it anyway and he didn't really seem to be watching it so you know so I just decided whatever I'll just like do it by myself so so I can get it up in time because this movie I actually I kind of wanted to do this one I was actually surprised that this one got picked in the patreon poll I just wanted to do this one because I saw that it came up uh you know for free like included with Amazon Prime and I thought to myself gosh I remember seeing that back in the theater when it came out in 2006 and I couldn't remember all that much about it. Pretty much the only thing I remembered about it was that it was okay and that I remembered it sort of being like weirdly over the top in a way that I wasn't entirely sure was intentional. Uh, so I was kind of like curious to see it again. Interestingly, I think this came out, I, I want to remember, I mean, it was 2006, it was a long time ago, but I feel like this came out really like in close proximity to Hollywood land, which was another similar neo-noir type thing, uh, except that was based around the death of George Reeves, uh, the original Superman actor. Whereas this one is tangentially about the Black Dahlia murder. Now I will say, if you haven't seen this, it was directed by Brian De Palma and uh, it kind of tanked his career in Hollywood. I don't know if this movie was the actual thing that did it. Um, it didn't make uh, it, even its budget back. I believe it only made 49 million uh, on a budget of 50 million. And he, uh, I believe he went indie or like uh, into foreign, uh, you know, investors and stuff after this. So he didn't make any more movies in Hollywood after this. I've heard, and again, I don't know if this is the case either, that it also pretty much tanked uh, Josh Hartnett's career. He was uh, the lead in this because this movie was not well received. I don't want to say all the reviews of it were negative at the time. I don't really remember reading a lot of reviews of it. And I remember when I saw it in the theater, not thinking it was terrible, but not thinking it was all that great either. Uh, so this is actually based not so much on the real murder, um, it's actually based on James Elroy's 1987 novel, which is also called The Black Dahlia. Now, I haven't read it. It seems to be one of James Elroy's more beloved novels, and I read a pretty detailed plot synopsis of it, and the movie does seem to s stick pretty close to the novel. As I said, it doesn't have a lot to do with the murder. The murder is kind of like, I almost want to say it's like a subplot or it's just kind of like a, you know, it's mostly about other things that are sort of surrounding the murder. Um, but the book is like that too. So it is actually a fairly close adaptation to the book. But I think what ended up happening with this is that when the novel came out, I kind of feel like this was James Elroy's first novel that he sort of got a lot of accolades um, of it being like an, an actual really, really good like literary novel from a literary standpoint. Whereas prior to that, I feel like he had been more known as, you know, like a pulp writer, like a crime writer. So this was the one that kind of cemented his place as like an actual quote unquote literary writer. Uh, and it was very well received. So pretty much as soon as it came out in 1987, uh, the rights were bought for movies, but it just kind of went back and forth and nothing really uh, happened with it. So then, obviously, uh, in 1997, I think it was, uh, there was an adaptation made of another of James Elroy's novels, which was L.A. Confidential, which, of course, was an amazing movie and was very, very well received. So then a lot of other you know, production companies were looking into adapting some of his other stuff, uh, and that's where The Black Dahlia came in. Now, initially, David Fincher was attached uh, James Elroy was very excited about this because he had seen Seven and he really liked it. Uh, David Fincher actually envisioned this more as a miniseries. And I kind of feel like I probably agree with him on this because the movie, uh, the original cut of it, so I've heard Brian De Palma's original cut of it, was over three hours long. Uh, and it had to be cut down by the producers to just about two hours. And... 
I kind of feel like that shows because the movie, although you can follow it, I feel like this is one of those ones where it's, I mean, because the story and even the story in the book is very, very convoluted. It's very complicated. There's a lot of side plots going on uh, that all sort of interconnect with one another. And I don't know if just one two hour movie is gonna cover all that. So I do kind of feel like if they, you know, if, if they were gonna make this into a single movie, I think a lot of the subplots could have been excised uh, and some stuff written around because this just comes across, it's not a bad movie, it just comes across as kind of muddled. And even when you get to the end and there are these really long expository scenes, like, you know, saying where all the links and everything get come together, you know, you're still kind of left going like, wait, what? You know what I mean? So it's one of those ones that, you know, I figured it out, like what was going on, but all the connections and stuff aren't entirely clear because there's so much stuff going on that maybe didn't need to be in there, it wasn't super relevant to the main plot. And I kept forgetting, you know, there'd be like a scene with like one dude, like this, you know, minor criminal or something. And then later they bring his name up again. And I'm just like, wait, who is that? I can't remember like who that is. You have to like keep going back and checking. So it's that kind of thing. So I feel like David Fincher's original idea for this, his original vision for this, making a mini series uh, was probably the way to go because this is a very, complex story. Now, as I said, this is not really about the Black Dahlia murder. It's it's a plot point in there, um, but it's just more like, it's almost kind of like the launching pad for this much bigger story about, uh, you know, the things that happen like with the cops that, uh, that are investigating it. And kind of like a, a little bit looking into sort of like the corruption that was going on, shit that was going on at the time. And, you know, and there's another thing too, you have to think that even though some of the stuff in the, in the movie and in the book uh, is true, like the way they found her body, the, you know, some of her backstory and things like that, um, in the book and the movie, the murder is actually solved uh, which obviously in real life it was not. So there's a lot of fictional stuff that is put in there, including the two cops who are the main characters who are played by Josh Hartnett and uh, Aaron Eckhart. Those two are completely fictional characters. And matter of fact, uh, I think one of the original ideas is that they were gonna have two characters from LA Confidential like turn up in this one as well. Like I don't think they were gonna be like main characters, but I think it was gonna be like a cameo but they uh, ended up not doing that. So uh, David Fincher was attached at first, but he couldn't really get the actors he wanted. He didn't, you know, he couldn't really get the mini series he wanted. Uh, he couldn't get the budget he wanted. And so finally he was just like, okay, I'm fucking off. And he went off and made Zodiac, which of course is a brilliant film. Uh, also not, not really in the same lines, but you know, still based on a killer or like a real crime. So he goes off and then they get uh, Brian De Palma so the movie is obviously a neo-noir uh, set at the, you know, the same time period that the murder took place, which was uh, late 1946, early 1947. Uh, it looks fantastic. Uh, the cinematography actually was nominated for an Academy Award, although I believe it lost to Pan's Labyrinth. Uh, but it looks beautiful. The costumes are beautiful. Uh, just the lighting is beautiful. The shots are beautiful. It's a, it's a gorgeous looking film. Uh, pretty much, it's funny how uh, this movie is just so based around Los Angeles of the 40s. Uh, not Most of it was not shot in Los Angeles. Most of it was actually shot in Bulgaria. Uh, some of the out exteriors, like Pantages Theater and stuff like that, that was shot in LA, but most of the stuff uh, was not. But you wouldn't really know that watching it. I mean, it looked, it looked very LA-like, so they did like a good uh, job with that. Now, what we have in the story... Um, some people, I feel like some uh, critics thought that it was almost like a parody of a noir uh, rather than a serious attempt at a noir. And I will, uh, I'll back that up, that assertion. But the weird thing about it is that tonally, it's very strange. It almost seemed to me, and I know that some of De Palma's other movies were like this too, and he's no stranger to making noir type movies. And most of his movies do have like a slight element of camp to them. And I do think that that's intentional. But the weird thing about this one is that it seems like it wants to be a serious 
noir film, but then it has some elements to it that seem intentionally like parody. You know what I'm saying? And I'm talking particularly of, uh, you know, just some of the dialogue and some of the, it's, it seems like some of the actors are taking it very seriously and some of them are just like chewing the scenery. Uh, so it's just like, it's a very strange, like, tonal uh, whiplash type thing. One of the things I'm talking about, and it's only a couple of scenes, I believe the actress's name is Fiona Shaw. She's great. I've seen her in uh, other stuff. But her character, I love her character, by the way. Like, I think her character, even though she's only in two scenes, is my favorite <laughs> part of this movie because she just goes for it and makes just this ridiculous, like, over the top. I mean, she is just like, it's just ham for days. And I love it. So the first scene where she's introduced, she's actually the mother of Hilary Swank's character, uh, who, you know, I'll get into that in a minute. And when we first meet her, she's kind of like this rich uh, socialite married to like a really rich dude uh, who the family ends up having something to do with the Elizabeth Short, the Black Dahlia murder. And she just comes across as this like foul mouthed drunk. And she's just like, she's just super hammered at the dinner table. And she's saying all kind of like catty, horrible things like to her husband and all this other shit. And then at the end, like the one scene where they're sort of like revealing uh, the very, very convoluted um, answer to the mystery, she just goes for it, man. She is just like screaming and flapping. It's like mommy dearest on steroids. And again, I kind of love it. I kind of wish that the movie, I kind of feel like the movie tries to split the difference between being a serious noir and just going over the top with the parody of it. I kind of wish they had leaned in one direction or another. And honestly, I love her so much because she just like fucking, she doesn't even give a single fuck and just goes like goes for it with the ham. Um, I kind of wish they had leaned more in that direction because that would have been really entertaining. Because I feel like one of the things that maybe bogs it down a little bit is that Josh Hartnett, who is, you know, a fine actor, I've seen him in other things. He was, you know, good in 30 Days of Night, but he comes across as very stoic to a point where, and I know that's kind of what his character is supposed to be like, but he comes across as really very bland and very kind of overly serious. And it just contrasts very weirdly with all of this kind of like crazy over the top camp kind of stuff going on. So it's like a really weird, it's a really weird juxtaposition and I'm not sure how I feel about it. It's a very strange movie. I had forgotten, because like I said, I haven't seen this since 2006. I actually saw this in the theater when it came out, because, you know, I was a big Brian De Palma fan, and I was a big true crime fan, so I was like, oh, well, all right, I'm, I'm down. Uh, and I remember, I don't remember hating it, but I don't remember loving it either. I remember liking Hollywoodland a lot better, which I think I saw around the same time, because they were out at the same time. Um, but I need to rewatch that one, too, now that I think about it. But I didn't remember, I remembered it being over the top. Like, I remembered that last scene being, like, real mommy, like, no wire hangers. I remember it kind of being, like, that kind of vibe. Um, but that was pretty much all I remembered about it. So I kind of feel like it might have been better if they had just leaned way into the camp uh, and almost made it like a black comedy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Maybe that might have like uh, worked out a little bit better. So what we have, as I said, not so much about the Black Dahlia murder. So what we're setting up is there's two cops, uh, Lee Blanchard and Bucky Bikert, Bikert, Bakert. I'm not really sure how you pronounce his last name. I can't remember. Like, I just watched the movie last night, but I can't remember how they pronounced it. So you have those two guys. Now, both of them were ex-boxers. Uh, and one of them, I guess Aaron Eckhart's character, Lee, is known as Mr. Fire because he's real fiery. And, uh, you know, Josh Hartnett's character, Bucky, is known as Mr. Ice. So they're cops now, and they're kind of, since they're sort of famous and everything, uh, they kind of get used as political tools because the LAPD are trying to get a pay raise. Uh, this is not based in reality or anything. Like I said, there is some stuff in here that's based in reality, like they talk about like the Zoot Suit riots and stuff like that, but most of the stuff in here is fictional. These two characters are both fictional characters, um, so don't get too bogged down into you know, oh, these are real people, or this is real shit that's going on. Some of the stuff that's going on in the background is real, but very, very little of it. Uh, so yeah, so these two boxers are coming there, and the cops trying to get a pay raise. So they stage this big 
um, like boxing match between the two of them. It's like big publicity stunt. They're trying to get this proposition passed that will raise their salaries. Um, so they end up doing that. So pretty much the first, I had forgotten about this too, like the first 15, 20 minutes of the movie, maybe longer, is just kind of setting up this whole boxing thing and how uh, Bucky is willing to take a fall uh, because they're going to give him like $8,000 or something like that in 1946 money so he can put his dad into a rest home because his dad has dementia. Uh, so, so that happens. Now, he starts hanging out, like him and Lee become partners. They're not homicide investigators at first or homicide detectives. They actually work warrants. So it's more kind of like, you know, vice kind of crime, like, you know, looking after people that, you know, skipped bond or whatever the fuck. Um, so they're working on that. So there's this whole convoluted thing, which sort of plays into it later on, that Lee, he was after this dude. I can't even remember because it does not really like relevant to the story. But he was he is worried about this one dude um, getting out of prison because uh, his name is Billy DeWitt. Uh, he's played by Richard Brake, by the way. I forgot he was in this movie. He's only in like one scene, I think. So Billy DeWitt was actually a dude that he used to know who essentially was the pimp of his, of Lee's now girlfriend, Kay, who's played by Scarlett Johansson. Uh, he was a dick and he branded her and all this other stuff. And what Lee did um, is he put ended up putting uh, Billy in prison and then essentially started shacking up with Lee's girlfriend. Uh, so now him and Kay are boyfriend and girlfriend, but she says they don't have sex. They live together. Lee paid for her to go to college. Uh, you know, he pays for this beautiful house for them because, like I said, he was a well-known boxer, so he has some money. And uh, so, so that's going on. But then this sort of like weird three not three way like in a sexual way but like a threesome sort of um develops between lee and bucky and Kay. whereas bucky who is single um just hangs out at their house all the time and all the three of them go out together all the time and they kind of set up like how nice a relationship this is uh you know just the three of them hanging out together so there's this whole thing and then there's like this other subplot which sort of plays into shit later on where Bucky and Lee are staking out this one guy who's supposed to go, uh, he's skipped Bond or something, but they find out that he's going to go do a drug deal. So they go there and they end up like in a shootout and they end up shooting the guy. And then meanwhile, while that's going on, uh, the body of Elizabeth Short, aka the Black Dahlia, is discovered like a couple blocks away. Now, because they're there on the scene, because they were involved in this other unrelated shootout, they, you know, pop on over there, even though they're not in homicide. So what ends up happening is that because they're sort of, you know, the golden boys, uh, you know, the police department is grateful to them for getting them a pay raise. So they're kind of like willing to let them do whatever. So they ask to be put temporarily um, on the homicide squad so they can investigate uh, help investigate the Black Dahlia murder uh, because for their own reasons. You find out later that Lee, I guess, uh, I believe it was his sister or something like that, like she got uh, kidnapped or murdered or disappeared or something like that. So he's kind of like obsessed with protecting women, it's, which is also kind of a thing uh, with what, what, what happened with Kay, how he rescued her from Billy DeWitt, although that was a lot more complicated. Uh, you know, you find out later on that whole story was a lot more complicated, which is like a bank robbery involved and shit like that. You know, it, it, Bucky is interested in solving the case, but he is a, like a lot more reluctant. So as the story goes on, Lee starts getting obsessed with the case to a point where he's, uh, you know, on Benny's all the time. Uh, and he's just becoming, he's not getting any sleep. He's never coming home. He's becoming uh, abusive toward Kay. And uh, basically, Lee has to kind of, uh, you know, or rather, Bucky has to come in and be like, hey, bro, you know, you got to chill out. Now, he ends up going, when uh, Billy DeWitt gets out of prison, he ends up kind of going after him. And while that's going on, Bucky starts to investigate, like, some of the Black Dahlia case himself. And this ends up uh, leading him to Hilary Swank's character, whose name is Madeline, who's this woman that he sees in this lesbian bar who, it's funny because like everybody in the movie keeps saying, oh, she looks just like Elizabeth Short. But the two actresses, Hilary Swank and uh, Mia Kirshner, who plays Elizabeth Short, you know, in 
that you only she's dead like at the beginning of the movie so you only see her in you know screen tests like old films and stuff like that uh so the two of them don't look anything alike uh they have they both have dark hair their hair is sort of styled similarly and they both have like sort of glammy black clothes but that's about as far as the that's about as far as the resemblance goes so it's just very weird that everybody just keeps saying that madeline's like oh she looks just like that dead girl i'm like "Mm, well she really doesn't but okay uh but yeah so uh bucky ends up getting involved with madeline who seems to know something about elizabeth shore like i met her at the lesbian club and you know, and she ends up saying later that she slept with her and stuff like that. But she's like, I don't really know anything about the murder. Uh, but she doesn't want her name in the papers associated with the murder because her dad is some big fucking big wig who made like zillions of dollars in uh, real estate or not real estate, but construction. And he built all this stuff like under the Hollywood land sign. And so there's all this other kind of shit. And they're just kind of like this really, really wealthy, like some somewhat degenerate, <laughs> insane family, as you find out. Uh, so Bucky gets involved with her, but as it goes on, she's kind of like your femme fatale type of character. Uh, it ends up her like knowing a lot more than she let on at first and that maybe she has her own motives for getting all up in Bucky's britches. So that whole thing is going on too. And meanwhile, um, they're also investigating some other leads having to do with Elizabeth Short. Um, as I said, they, they find out, they find like all these stag films that she was in, uh, where she was doing like lesbian porn and all this other kind of stuff. So as it goes on, um, I don't want to spoil too much about it in case you want to watch it. Like I said, it's on Amazon prime. As I said, it doesn't really have that much to do with the actual murder other than, I mean, they got the, the autopsy stuff, right? Like what was happened to her body? Yes. She was cut in half. Yes. She had a Glasgow smile. Yes. You know, she had, uh, you know, head wounds that were consistent with being beaten to death. Yes. Her body was drained of blood. Yes. Her body was, uh, washed before it was, uh, left there. And, you know, the, so so the crime scene stuff, it's not a real gruesome movie. They do kind of show the body briefly a couple of times, and it's pretty accurate uh, to what the actual body looks like if you've seen the crime scene photos, which I have, which are horrifying. Um, so they did get that part right. But other than that, uh, this is almost entirely a work of fiction. Um, most of the characters are fictional. Uh, the resolution of the mystery is completely fictional, although it's sort of based on a couple of suspicions that were going on at the time. I believe Elliot Ness um, thought that maybe uh, the same guy that he suspected was the Cleveland Torso murderer, who I think is like Dr. Francis Sweeney is, I think his name. Um, he was convinced that that guy might have also done uh, done the Black Dahlia murder. I don't know if I agree with that, but that was what he thought anyway. So this kind of takes that, but puts it all, you know what this kind of reminded me of now that I'm thinking about it? It kind of reminded me of uh, From Hell, where they took an actual series of murders um, and had some factual shit in there about it, but then it like weaves this big grand conspiracy theory type of thing where basically there were like lots of people, lots of really wealthy, powerful people involved in this murder for really sordid reasons. So I kind of feel like this has the same vibe as that. All the people that are implicated in this, like in the murder, uh, you know, the rich family that's up there, they are completely fictional. That's not a real family. So they're not like, you know, impugning anyone's uh, reputation or anything like that. Most of these people are not real. Uh, So I, it's just that I'm not sure as a movie, this isn't, it's an okay movie. Um, but I'm kind of interested one, I'm kind of interested to see what David Fincher would have done with it. And if he had been able to make it a mini series, like he originally wanted, um, I'd also be curious to see the director's cut of it, which was apparently over three hours long, because I don't know, I feel like there was, like I said, the book is very, very complicated. There's basically four or five different subplots going on. They all kind of intertwine, but you can get away with that in a book. In a movie, you really have to kind of, you know, distill stuff down to the essence if you're just going to make, you know, like a two hour movie out of it. And I kind of feel like this could have been more focused because there's a lot of stuff going on that probably didn't need to be in here because it was, even though it might be relevant in the plot of the book, uh, because there's a lot more, you know, threads that tie together in the movie, I think they should have focused more 
on the murder investigation itself instead of all this kind of other stuff that was going on. I know that they wanted to do, that he wanted to do something more like, oh, I'm going to focus on the two cops and how it affects them. But I kind of feel like if you were going to do that, they should have just focused on that. And I felt like that got a little bit lost. Honestly, Lee, played by Aaron Eckhart, he was actually the cop that was supposedly the more obsessed with it but he doesn't get as much screen time. Uh, basically, he he gets really interested in the case. Uh, he comes home and he's a raging jerkwad and they're talking about how he's on uh, Benzedrine and he's just like flipping out and getting obsessed with it and he gets kicked out the house and then basically he disappears uh, for a large part of the rest of the movie until like one big scene where, you know, something bad happens. But most of it is focused on Josh Hartnett's character, Bucky, who is not as interesting and is not as obsessed with the case. I mean, he's basically only, you know, following it up because he's worried about Lee and he thinks that he might know some stuff about it that Lee didn't know or he might be involved in something that Lee wasn't involved in. So he's kind of just investigating it almost because he feels like he should or he has to because his friend was into it. I think it would have been more interesting to focus on the character that was actually obsessed with it and how that... Uh, affected their relationships, but it's it's just kind of a strange choice to focus on the guy that was just kind of like reluctantly involved in the case and not the dude that was like really super into it. So I kind of feel like maybe, I don't know, maybe it could have been like pared down. I know it's based on the book and I know the book has the two things and it's kind of the same, but for the movie, I kind of feel like they should have cut down on the characters and they should have cut down on a lot of the subplots and just focused on, I just, I didn't, they didn't need the boxing stuff. They didn't need, cause that was, that was a, a chunk of the film. I was like, I didn't even, when I started watching the movie and I was just kind of like, man, how long is this boxing stuff going to go on? It's like, you know, when are they going to find Elizabeth Short's body? So I just kind of feel like all that could have been excised. It didn't really have anything to do with, or it could have just been, you know, I know that it had something to do with, you know, them being like kind of the golden boys at the police station and, you know, how they got to be partners and stuff. But that could have just been a line or two of dialogue. They didn't really have to show it all of it and like, you know, them doing the boxing match and this big drama about it because it didn't really have anything to do with the larger plot. So, uh, you know, I think that there's actually a good movie in here. Like I said, it's it's beautiful looking. It's very well directed. Um, but I just kind of feel like it's too convoluted. Um, you know, it could have been trimmed down. It could have been focused more on one thing instead of having all this other stuff going on that, because I kind of feel like all the subplots get kind of short shrift because, you know, you're, it's not in, in service of the main investigation. So, you know, even though some of those people did have ties to it, it didn't really matter all that much. Um, so I kind of feel like a lot of that could have been cut out. And honestly, I have to say, and I'm not shitting on any of the actors, but I think some of the actors in this were probably not bad actors, but just like miscast maybe. Um, and I would have liked to have seen it with different actors. Uh, Aaron Eckhart is fine in it. Uh, Scarlett Johansson is fine in it. Um, I would have liked to see someone other than Josh Hartnett in it. Oh, he's fine, but I would have liked to see someone with a little more charismatic. Um, and I didn't really buy Hillary Swank in that role. So I kind of wish they would have got somebody. I think actually uh, Faruza Balk was uh, up for that at some point. Uh, Jennifer Connelly, I think, was up for it at some point or, you know, or that was one of the ones that they wanted or they approached. Um, so I would have been interested to see someone with, with more of a femme fatale kind of vibe to her or somebody with like more of a I don't know, more of like a 1940s glamour girl type thing. Like more, you know, more like a a starlet from back then. Actually, maybe Scarlett Johansson would have been better in that role now that I'm thinking about it. Maybe they should have switched them. Now, now that I'm thinking, that might have worked. Um, you know what I mean? Because Kay doesn't really... Kay's character, Scarlett Johansson's character, uh, she's not really a femme fatale. She's just kind of like this woman that's kind of caught in the middle, like in a bad situation. Uh, even though she ends up not being squeaky clean later. Like I said, it's a noir. Uh, everybody, has, everybody has secrets. That's kind of the whole thing. But uh, yeah, I mean, if you like Brian De Palma... It's not as bad as some critics uh, would contend, but it's not really all that great either. And I, it's kind of a shame because it seemed like a missed opportunity because this actually would have made a really good, maybe they should remake it. Somebody should remake it. Because it seemed like, I mean, from the plot synopsis, the Philip El or the uh, James Elroy novel, I almost said Philip Marlowe, I don't know why, but uh, the James Elroy novel, um, it sounded like it would be, it would be a good, 
film. I don't know if I'd necessarily call it the Black Dahlia because people, I know that's what the book is called, but um, people might come into it with the expectation, as I did, that this is actually going to be about the murder. But it's not really. I mean, it's in there, but it's kind of, it's almost like a background. So there's, I mean, because there's so much stuff going on in this. So I really do feel like this could have been really distilled down to the essence of that and then the rest of the stuff just kind of like minimized and i think this might have worked out better with like a lot more focus but you know yeah your mileage may vary so let's see what everyone has to say about it in the comments have you seen it uh if you haven't seen it go watch it on amazon prime and tell me what you thought about it, especially if you're a Brian De Palma fan. Uh, tell me, do you think that this was worthy of his whole career in Hollywood being tanked? I think, like I said, everything everything he's done since then has been, uh, you know, overseas or indie funded. Uh, so, yeah, so this kind of like, um, you know, pretty much his career bombed after this one. Uh, so do you think that that's justified or not? Let me know in the comments and I will see you guys on the next movie retrospective. Bye.